Hello, Facebook. How you guys doing today? We're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing part of your Sunday with us. I'm Brian Sheffy. I'm Donya Williams. And we are Genealogy Adventures Live. <laughs> yes, yes. So today we're doing critical thinking. You know what critical thinking is. It's thinking outside of the box, using your outside thought process to try to figure out, you know, what's the best route, what's the best way to go to do everything and how to find it. So we figured that with, um, with our research and, and what it is that we do, as far as African Americans are concerned, we have to go a whole nother route in order to find our families. And critical thinking is, is, is really detrimental in the research for African Americans. So, um, yeah, Brian, why don't you talk some more about that? Okay. So as Donnie was saying, um, we're talking about critical thinking today. And as well as thinking outside of the box, critical thinking is also about getting you to think about how you think. And I know that's kind of a strange way to put it. Um, but again, when I was um, getting my MA in higher education um, to get my qualifications to teach master's degree courses at, at college, critical thinking was, um, it was a really important part of the course because it's something that we actually try to get us, you know, something that Europeans probably do more than, than here. Um, is getting students to think about their thinking, to document their thinking, to be able to articulate and express how they get from A to B to C to D. And there is no perfect skill for genealogy than that. Because a lot of times, when I'm, especially when I'm speaking to my South Carolina cousins like Loretta or Hamad or Opal, Dania, and when she was with us with uh, Sheila, being able to think critically one, about how I was thinking, and two, about how I was making, uh, I don't want to say, a, well, yeah, I guess it, assumption's a fair word, um, about records that I was accessing and who they were applicable to and how I was trying to figure out who someone's parents were. Because I was thinking critically and I was making those notes, I could articulate that. I could say things like, look at the family names, look at who they were living near, Look at the, you know, and look at look at these records, kind of a thing. <clears throat> so basically, critical thinking asks six basic questions. Um, and if you work in PR marketing, you're gonna you're gonna know most of these anyway, and you're gonna apply them the same way as if you were doing marketing or advertising. So the six questions about critical thinking are who, what, where, when, how, and why. And those are really six important. Those are six important questions when it comes to genealogy. So, who? That's probably the easiest one to kind of chat about and discuss. So, the who question in terms of critical thinking and genealogy is who benefits from our research? Well, we do. Genealogists, obviously, we get into this because we're interested in finding out about more, more about where we come from, who we come from, and our and our people's histories. And again, also to kind of build on what Donia said, not only is critical thinking important for African Americans, a lot of us are going to have some very poor ancestors, some very poor white ancestors, free people of color as well, Native Americans who have sketchy documentation, um, especially if you're in the, living in the Appalachian region, a lot of our ancestors, even the white ones, couldn't read and write. So documentation for them it's a bit patchy, it's a bit sketchy. I, it's the bane of my existence, and I'm sure it's the bane of your existence too. So who, again, coming back to who benefits from us, we do, the genealogists, our families do, those of them who are interested in genealogy, and we can all appreciate that not everyone in our family is. Um, projects like the Sheila Hightower Allen Memorial Fund will see an entire, not only just an entire community in South Carolina, benefit from our research. And the questions that we're asking that prompted that research, pretty much two thirds of South Carolina is also gonna benefit because the, the extension of that project pretty much hits quite a bit of that state. Um, who is this harmful to? Uh, as Donnie and I have found out through genetic genealogy, some of our family members had extra kids. I hate calling them side kids. They had extra kids. That's a really sensitive issue. If you're an adoptee, 
are your birth parents going to be, you know, and your uh, half siblings going to be happy to hear from you? That's another, you know, that that's another kind of thing that you really, you need to think about your thought process to be able to kind of come up with an answer for yourself on that one. Things like who is directly affected by our research. So that kind of gives you a general idea. In terms of what, what covers things like what are the strengths and weaknesses um, in our, you know, both in terms of our thinking, um, our assumptions, the records that we're finding, uh, asking yourself, is there not, you know, what is another perspective from that? Um, are there other alternatives? Are there other ways that you could go about researching? And again, when it comes to brick walls, all of those kind of questions come into play. Things like what's the best or worst case scenario? Um, and I'm sure we all have vivid imaginations to think about that in a genealogical context. Um, in terms of research strategies, research outcomes, um, problem solving, you know, what's the most important thing that you want to tackle and what's the least important thing? Uh, we all have research priorities and getting yourself thinking about how you think can help you better prioritize what your kind of immediate things that you want to research, what can wait, to, you know, what can wait till a back burner. You know, for Donnie and I, we'll get into this a little bit more, researching our Hammonds in South Carolina, we know we have to do it. We know we have to do it, but because we're critically aware of how we think, we know, we're, we know that we're not emotionally ready yet to start tackling the Hammonds. Um, so I'm really, you know, I'm appreciative that she and I are both on the same page and we both kind of talk about the reasons why we're very reluctant to get into that. Yeah. Um, where is pretty applicable. Um, when? You know, uh, when quest questions basically answer the, the question, you know, when is, when is research acceptable or unacceptable? Uh, when would this benefit society? Um, given the peculiar kind of political extreme environment that we're in at the moment, makes the Sheila Hightower uh, project even more important. Yes. Um, because we, Donnie and I really believe that that's a really, that's a really good way to unify people who come from very different backgrounds. Um, like I said, that, that answers that kind of one critical thinking question. Uh, when is the best time to take action? When will we know when we've succeeded? Um, in terms of genetic, ge you know, genetic genealogy, I know when we've, me and my team have succeeded, when we've done our segmentology, when, we, when we've identified ancestors, direct ancestors, and then we start getting matches on those ancestors. Um, so again, that's a really big question for people to think about. When will you know when your genealogical research has been successful? And that's going to be different for everyone. There is no cut. The thing that I love about critical thinking is about the process. Most times there are no hard and fast answers. There's no right or wrong. Um, so that's one of the things that I love about that. Uh, the why question. Why questions with critical thinking answers things like, is this a problem or a challenge? Um, is what I'm doing relevant to others? Uh, is, and again, who are the other people that would be influenced or, if, or affected by the research that I'm doing? And the how, you know, I, you know, in terms of critical thinking, when you ask about how, how does this disrupt things? How is what I'm doing kind of uh, disruptive? How do we know when we've reached the truth about something? How will we approach what we're doing safely? Um, and again, uh, I'm just going to speak about the safety thing quickly. A lot of times on Facebook, I'll see where people have done like a little screen grab of a family tree or a genetic match, and they haven't erased or obscured someone's name. Um, I know I, I'm a very public persona. My tree is public. I, you know, I post stuff all the time, so I'm probably be a little bit more lenient about that. But I can see where people would be, you know, you're basically posting someone else's information online that pertains to you. Um, so again, you know, there's, there is a safety issue and there's kind of a data sharing issue with, um, with genealogy and sharing that information. And you have to think about how you, how you think about that. Um, how does the work that we do benefit others? Um, how is what we're doing maybe potentially harmful to each other. So, you know, that's kind of doing it in a very, very broad context. Um, and to steer this kind of back into some pretty solid genealogy, I'm going to hand this back over to Dania, 
who has two different examples of how we've applied critical thinking to our own research. So over to you. Okay, so I have two families. Of course, it's my Yale Dells and then my Williams. Those are my, my, my base right now, um, what I've been doing. Hey, cousin, first, let me let me say hello to all of the people we have so far who've been commenting. So I'm going to repost all of that. We have um, Barbara. She said hello. And then we have Stephanie. And A.E. Barlow is checking in from Northern Virginia. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you? And then we always have our crazy cousin, Kevin. And <laughs> And, and he wants to know why in the world was he looking for us on YouTube live? Oh no, I don't know, Kevin, but you know where we are. So you found us. YouTube, YouTube is on demand. We publish that usually the day after this live broadcast. So if you right. want to catch us live, this is the place to do it. That's right. That's right. And then we have Flower Stewart from Chester. Hello, Flower. And we have Tony, our cousin Tony. Hey, how you doing? And then we have Patricia. Patricia is also a cousin, um, a family member. Um, and then there is Marquita Kida Fletcher from Tennessee. How you doing? And we, um, let me see. So Barlow, he says, says, wow, I'm rocked by this approach, which is so crucial. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Yes, it is very, very crucial. And then we have one more hello from, from Karen Bertram, and Kevin's laughing. So, you know, you know, Cousin Kev, that's our guy. <laughs> so, Brian, Kevin has been venting to me late at night because he's finding stuff out, and he's like, I don't see how you and Brian do it. It's too much. But he's pushing through and we have his back and we're there. So, you know, you know, Kevin, we're always going to be there. We're always going to be there. <laughs> and can I just say thank you so much for all the comments because the comments are coming through. And thank you as well for all the people who are sharing. Donnie, this is being shared already. That is so cool. Thank you for that. That is so cool. Yes, please share it. So, okay, let's get into this, this genealogy thing of critical thinking. Huh, okay, so critical thinking. I had to, I had a family and I was doing my research and it looked like a brother and sister got married, point blank. And I had to pause on it and I, I kept going back and forth and, looking at it and y'all know by now for those that that watch us and really getting to know is y'all know by now that this stuff this is what turns my stomach like i have not i've been researching for 25 years and i just simply cannot get past the the incest i cannot get past the incest even in my book when i wrote in the book and i learned from the vital statistics site that as of May 2013, they stopped changing who can marry who and why. Now that particular information is on Wikipedia. And it's on that Wikipedia site where it tells you which state um, will allow for people to marry first cousins and second cousins and why you can marry them and so on and so forth. And we'll put that link up there in case you guys need it. Um, but uh, I came across this one set in my family tree, and they were a part of the Yale deals, older Yale deals. So y'all don't get, you know, don't don't freak out. It ain't nobody we know. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, I thought it was a brother and a sister, and I don't care how I turned and looked at it. It was brother and sister. One minute the woman's name was Rosetta, Rosetta. the next minute she was Rosella, and I wasn't sure. Okay, I'll get you the book details. Um, but I wasn't sure about why why if this person was it seems that Rose Ella or Rose Etta was the mother to this particular man. And the wo the woman that he married seemed to have the same mother. So I kept going through it over and over and over again. And then finally I gave up. I went over it like maybe a day or two and I gave up and I went to Brian and I said, Brian, 
And I was really sad, y'all. I was so sad. You were. <laughs> you so were. <laughs> I was so sad because it just, it was too much for me. And, um, I said, Brian, um, I think I just went past, just, just reached my limit. And he was like, what do you mean? I said, I think I found a brother-sister marriage. And he's like, what? Okay, let me see it. So I, I sent it to him. And I, I promise you guys, Brian and I sit on the phone for hours researching. We could sit real quiet and just research. So I sat on the phone with Brian and as he was looking through it. And I promise you guys, I was sitting there like this. And what was and, my reaction? My reaction and, was like, no, no, right. no, no. And, and, but then you would just hear Brian in the background. No, okay, wait. Well, let me try this. And then he would go another way. It was like, okay, well, well, let me try that. And while he's going through all that, I'm sitting there. Because I couldn't, everything that he was trying, I knew. I saw. And I already knew. I'm like, this is crazy. But lo and behold, our wonderful and beautiful cousin Loretta came into the picture. And Loretta showed us the direction that we needed to go in order to see that they were two different women. But that's that was the that was the portion of the critical thinking. We had to find why Rose Ella was one person and Rose Etta was another person. And you have to literally go through your census records looking at every individual row, checking every single date, looking at every Anything that you normally don't look at, you have to look at. And that was what happened. We ended up finding a, I believe it was a social security application that showed us the difference between the Rose Ella and the Rose Etta. But these women's birth dates were the same. They were. I mean, it was the most amazing thing. I think birth the dates were the same. They were living in more le- they were living in this I think they were either living in the same town or two towns that were like right next to each other. Yes, it, it was just it didn't make any sense that we just knew it was them. So you know that was the thing with with that particular we had to look at everything. We, we ended up finding a document that finally separated it. but it was the, the breakdown, the critical thinking we had to break all of that down in order for us to really figure out who was who and why they were the way that they were. But again, because we also had the conversation on the phone going, if this is right, if a half brother and a half sister really did get married, well, good think about the critical thinking questions. Well, who was that going to affect? That's going to affect their direct descendants. It wasn't going to really affect Donnie and I because th- these people were our cousins. Even so we though relate- affect me. <laughs> so we were related to them? but we weren't directly related to them. So we were both being very mindful that we have to be really careful about this because there are going to be people who are going to be directly impacted to all of a sudden find out that their three, four, five times great grandparents were half siblings. So thankfully we're able to prove that they weren't, that, you know, they were two completely different women, but that was a really mind, you know, that was a really mindful consideration for us. Yeah. I mean, cause we have to share this information once we find it. So, in order to break that stuff down and to actually think about the fact, are we sharing it? Cause I can remember us having the conversation. Well, who's going to tell them? And Brian was mm-hmm. like, I'm not touching it. Like, well, we got to make sure this is correct before we even put this information out there. Like this is crazy. But then the other one was, um, I think Brian wanted me to talk about the Moses Williams one, but I forgot got the Moses, but I remember the one with Jane. So there was, Jane Williams is my two-time great-grandmother. And when I found her, I think I talked to you guys once before when I found her on the 1870 and the 1880 census. And when we found her on those, well, actually, we, we found her on two 1870 census. This is a perfect example of critical thinking. Because on the 18, one of the 1870 census, she was listed as Jane Sr., married to my great, um, great grandfather, John Sr. But on the other 1870 census, she was listed as Jane Williams. And she had three of her children with her. Now, here's where the, the thing goes in. My settles line 
had a woman by the name of Anna May who married Wesley Settles. And they said that her mother was Jane Williams. But they said that Anna's father was a man with the last name Harley. Now, when I found those two on the 1870 census, I realized that that was my Jane Williams, the John Sr.'s wife. But I didn't think that I had a connection to the Anna that they were talking about. And my Anna, who my Jane had, was also listed. So we had two Janes, two Annas, two Savannahs, all together, listing. One in 1870, listed as 18, as um, with the last name Senior. Another 1870 census listed with the last name Williams. When I tell you guys we had to really separate through all that, we had to separate through that to find it out. What helped us finally get this straight was the fact that there was a man, one of our family members who tested and he ended up matching my mother right where he needed to match. And it was because of his DNA match proved that that was the two same Jane Williams and that the Anna May who married the Settles, her father is actually John Sr., Sr., not the Harlan guy that they thought. We still have some family members that don't follow on that too much, and that's fine. But at this point, with the proof of the DNA, I'm just waiting on them to catch up. <laughs> Because again, you know, as as family, you know, family historians and genealogists, we 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 come across this. People have a vested interest in certain outcomes. Where I think I've certainly learned over the years to just keep an open mind, and I just go with I go with the records and the DNA takes me. So I take I try to take me out of the equation. I try to take my expectations out of the equation, and I literally just follow the trail. And Don and Donnie does that as well. So, you know, while she and I are confident that, you know, we've used critical thinking to arrive at the right identity for, you know, Annie Mae and for Jane, and we have matched, you know, we match people through them. Um, there are other, are some, you know, there are some other family members who that doesn't either jive with oral history or that wasn't what they were expecting or that's not what they want. So a lot like it, like Anything else in life, we don't necessarily get what we want, but you do get what you need. And we needed that DNA match to prove yes. who, Annie Mae, who Annie Mae really was. The one about Moses Williams was the confusion between whether he was the father or the son. Oh. So, you know, Donnie was like, she filled me up. She was just ecstatic and she was excited. The Moses Williams that we have in our tree, you know, our mutual ancestor, our three times great grandfather, I've got, you know, I found him in the newspapers. Or did you find him in a book? Was it the newspaper or the book that came first? No, what happened was, as far as that one was concerned, and yeah, I was excited, but I was excited, scared, not excited, happy. I want everybody to understand that. <laughs> Because when I found him, I found an article stating that he was the father of 45 children. So although I was excited, I was excited, but I was scared about it because I knew as soon as I told Brian about this man who had 45 children, he was going to make me research him. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to research nobody with 45 yeah. kids whose children were born during slavery time. I mean, I, who wants to do that? So. I found him and I, and I told Brian about it and everything. And um, he was like, wow, are you serious? And I said, yeah, this is, I'm going to show you the link. And I sent him the link. And when I sent him the link, I followed it up with saying, Brian, I'm not researching this. Okay. And he was like, uh-huh, okay. And, you know, he was looking through it and everything. And then my, my wonderful, handsome cousin turns around and finds another article about Moses Williams. And when he finds the second article, the second article says that it's Moses Williams and he had 45 kids, but he had died. It was actual obituary note for an African-American. And um, it said in that he died in 1884, mind yeah. you. Yes. Got to say that. Thank you. And it was an actual obituary for an uh, African-American in 1884. 
and it was very short and it was very, very brief. And it basically just stated that he had died and he still had 43 children living. That's what it said. But what got me was the fact that it was 1884 and he was 115 years old. Yeah, that was the other thing that it said, that he was 115. So, I mean, I'm, I'm good at math. I'm real good at math. And my Moses was born in 1791, the one that I was thinking was Moses Williams with the 45 kids. But then I saw that and I'm like, mm, 1791 don't add up to 115 in 1884. Who is this? And that's when Brian said it. It's Moses Sr. So we started to go through that. And as we've been doing our research, we ended up finding out that Moses Sr. and Moses Jr. were father and son. And through critical thinking, through deducing, through breaking up different documents, reading land re deeds and wills and, and all kinds of inventory records, we found Moses Junior and Moses Williams on the same inventory when Moses Williams was 22. That's when we figured it all out. But before you say anything, Brian, we have some people that have some questions. Yeah, I was going to so, ask um, Tony who, if <clears throat> so how do you follow the trail? If you wouldn't mind just expanding on that just a little bit, um, what kind of what kind of trail were you talk, talking about? Um but and while you're answering that, I mean, we can, I guess we can kind of chat about that. A lot of the times, um, depending on who it is, uh, we follow the trail through, through the actual records that we have to hand. And for different groups of people, those are going to be different sets of records. So if you're talking about <clears throat> um, after slavery, you know, basically uh, African-Americans after, after slavery, it's the same as anyone else. You start with the 18th, you start working your way back up, up to and including the 1870 census. Then again, if your ancestors were enslaved, you know, you need to look at, you need to first identify who is the most likely person to have uh, enslaved your ancestor. And a lot of times you can actually figure that out just by where they're living in 1870. So much of our family, for instance, was still living on the land of the last person or the last family who enslaved them. Right. Um, and if the names are the same, it's like, well, this could be a brother, a sister, an uncle, an aunt, a father, someone. It's someone to them. Because again, a lot of our South Carolina ancestors were uh, mixed race. So it was a pretty, you know, again, using critical thinking and previous experience, it's like, yeah, okay, um, th this is a group of people that we need to look at. So you start looking at will, um, the wills of the, 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 fam the enslaving families. You start looking at wills, probate records, <clears throat> estate inventories, slave deeds. You look at absolutely every single record that you can conceivably get your hand on. Um, some enslaving families, um, like my, oh, they've just gone out of my head, my Caldwells, you know, they actually listed the names of the births and deaths of their enslaved population. Oh, it wasn't them, it was the Carters. The, the births and deaths of their enslaved people, including family groups. So any kind of records associated with enslaving families is really, really good. Free people of color, you have think, free people of color had to register at the county courthouse every single year, I think just to basically get their freedom papers. The cool thing about that though, is they actually usually give a little description of the person who was um, attending court to say, yep, my mother was born free, her mother was born free, I'm born free. Um, those are really good records. Again, just like um, white people of the same, the same era, a lot of free people of color own their own property, they own their own land. So you need to look at title deeds, you know, deed documents. If they had wills, um, going to the county courthouse, all that kind of a thing. Um, I suppose you, you know, predominantly European genealogy is pretty much straightforward, although I did say that a lot of that can be influenced by economics. So if you have wealthy white ancestors, you know that pretty much they're going to be pretty well documented. Um, the myriad of documents, lineage books, although I qualify about lineage books when you because I'm saying this from bitter experience with my Settles family. Settles are confusing enough 
It's um, spelled a myriad of ways. It can be S-E-T-T-L-E, then add an S at the end of it, S-U-T-T-L-E, then add an S <laughs> after it. So me being naive, I found this subtle, subtle family history book, and I thought, oh, I got lucky. Put all the information into my tree because the book has been published for a long time. I hadn't seen anything negative um, about it in terms of saying whether or not it had any errors or mistakes. So I just put it all in, into my tree going all the way back up to Yorkshire and England. Come to find out our uh, cousin Hamad and another cousin Oprah were like, no, oh, that book is riddled with errors. Do not use that book, which means I had to delete all of it out of my tree, which took about four days, and then actually rebuild it doing what I would normally do. I was still kind of new in genealogy back then, but I actually just went back to the records, looking at deeds, christenings, baptisms, death records, marriage records, just the lot to slowly piece it back together. And when I got to the settles of England, stopped using American lineage books because usually when I, from my own personal experience, I find that when American genealogy books start leaving these shores and start going back to Europe, that's when the big errors start happening. So I will always go back to that country's lineage book. So if I'm looking for an English family, I'll only use English lineage books. The same with Welsh families, Scottish families, Irish families, French, German. I will use that country's lineage books and I will always ask, I found this book. Does anyone have, you know, are there any concerns? Is it factually correct? Is it a good book to use? I wait for the feedback and then I use it. And I always use that as a backbone. And then I look for the records to back up what the book is saying. And by and large, but, you know, the ones that I've used have been have been really, really good. So again, that's following the trail really depends on what kind of ancestors you're looking for. If you have Quaker ancestry, you have to get, you know, Quakers kept just the most brilliant and amazing records. I wouldn't have been able to reconstruct half of my Quaker colonial genealogy without those records and those books. They are awesome. Um, so again, that, that's another brilliant resource that you use. But the trail is the trail. You try to find as many records as you can to prove what you need to prove, to prove that you have the right ancestor mixed in with the right people, and you just work your way back generation after generation. I don't know if you want to jump in, Donia. Yeah, so that's basically it. And I'm jumping in because there are still questions. So Flower Stewart says, where can I find slave deeds? Basically, what those are is the inventory records. So say someone, if you know who an enslaved person, you know who one of your enslavers were, who one of your family enslaved slavers were, and you look at their will. When you look at their will, in, in most instances, an inventory is collected, connected with it. But even if they don't have a will, they still are going to have an inventory if they died interstate because that stuff has to be added up mon monetarily so they can see how their debts are going to be paid. So look for inventory lists. And then um, another thing that you can do is depending on where your family is from. So taking we Brian and I use where our family is from to try to explain to you guys, because we believe that Edgefield is where every person who wants to become a genealogist, they need to cut their teeth there because it gives you every example of hell that you could think of. So um, using Edgefield as an example, we go, we look at their land records. We look at their deeds. We look at where, they were living at the time and who was living around them, all of those different things. So like Brian said, for example, my Martha Brooks, I know that she lived on the Lemuel's Brooks lot. So because I know he, she, that was the last person she was enslaved by. When I went on to family search and started to look at the Freedman deeds and the Freedman um, contracts, I typed in Lemuel Brooks. So this is a two prong thing. This is going to answer Flowers' question and then back to Tony. Tony, this is how you answer because Tony said what I was trying to say was how do I follow the trail, meaning him personally. So basically what you're going to do is say if you know who your enslaver is, 
and you know where your family, you know that your family was with this enslaver before the Civil War ended. After the Civil War ended, what you do is you go and you look for a freedman contract. Look for a freedman contract in that person's name. Uh, so far, we've been almost spot on every time. When we go and look for a freedman contract in one of the old enslavers' names, we see our families right there. So we find out that they're living on their land. And those are the things that, that's how we do it. But that's what African-Americans have to do in order to find their families. We need to find out who the white families are so we can see who our families are. And, and we can do like that. I was going to say, part of the journey that you're going to go through is identifying where those records are held. Yes. So most, most counties, um, well, actually, again, to dispel a notion, all 13 colonies had slaves. All 13 colonies have slave records. They all have slave deeds. Now, New England and the Mid-Atlantic states stopped slavery way earlier than the South did, so obviously there's, like, there's going to be a cutoff date for that. Although saying that, there was um, the last person who was a slave in Pennsylvania died in 1833. So that's how kind of long that carried through. Now, not all counties have digitized their records. So taking South Carolina for an example, uh, Barnwell, which is a county that Donnie and I and quite a few of us are very interested in because that's a part of the Moses Williams story, they haven't digitized. They aren't even books that list Barnwell deeds. We actually will have to physically go to Barnwell. First of all, we have to figure out, well, we actually, we know, we know where those deeds yeah. are kept. So we have to go there and we're gonna have to actually physically go through each and every deed to try to find the information that we need. Edgefield, there's a book. There's, you can access slave deeds from Edgefield on ancestry.com. Um, I think family search as well, but I'm not, not sure about that one. Um, Abbeville has them. New, you, know, Ab you can get slave deeds for Abbeville and Newberry in a brilliant, brilliant book. So it's a matter of, one, the, you, know, you have to figure out how the records been digitized. If they have been digitized, where can I access them? If they haven't been, then you have to actually physically, you have to find out where they're physically stored and then you have to go to that yeah. place and go through them. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind, we've had a couple of upsets in American history. So some counties like Charles City County, they, because of the Civil War, most of their colonial records are gone. Just they were burnt, destroyed, gone, never to be found again. Um, and that's like property deeds, wills, probate, state, slave deeds, the lot. Um, so that's something that you're going to have to investigate too. One thing that a lot of Americans don't realize is, you know, we were a colony. A lot of our colonies were British or, you know, managed and run by the British. A lot of our early colonial records, copies are kept in the British National Archives. So I'm using Charles, County, Charles City County in Virginia as an example. They lost a lot of their colonial records. They are not duplicates of everything, but I have seen wills, probate, property records, deeds, uh, council minutes from council meetings in England for Virginia, for Charles City County. So I know that a lot of, you know, buying a ticket and going to a hotel to England to like try to do your research isn't going to be within everyone's kind of financial, <laughs> finan yeah, in their budget. Because, it, you know, it isn't. But in terms of critical thinking and thinking about where records are, where they're stored, how you can access, how you can identify them. That's another example of thinking out of the box. So again, just to kind of say, Britain actually has a lot of records from, from our early colonial period. So that's something else to think about. Yeah. So, and then another thing that everybody, you know, I think one of the, what, where critical thinking really began to help me was when I started to open up my mind and, and think about the fact that there were 13 colonies before anything. So if I have family, if you have family in Mississippi, 
they got to go back to one of those 13 colonies. That's the thing that people don't think about. Critical thinking is actually another, you can also say that this is about logically thinking. You have to think logically. So if you know, and I don't know the date when Mississippi was, was you know, finally entered in as a state or what have you, but it wasn't before Carolina because Carolina was one of the first 13 colonies. After the, after, let me see, they were 13 colonies and then they turned into states and then everything else was turned into a state after that. Now the dates, I'm, I'm, I can't think of the wording of how I'm trying to say that, but the thing, the bottom line is, is that people who have family in Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, y'all need to look in South Carolina and Virginia for your family. Because even though eight, they may go back to 1830, they'll go back further in, in those places. They had to come from somewhere. They're not aliens. They just didn't appear in Mississippi. It's not going to happen that way. Um, Mississippi was a territory when, when the Carolinas was formed. I mean, the Carolinas were formed as a colony in 1729 separately. They became their own separate entity, 1729. So Mississippi wasn't formed. So where, where's your family? Where did they, where's, they can't be there. If y'all understand what I'm trying to get across. So you, you have to think logically. You have to really apply your history that you did learn from school to what you're learning now. And then well, I, think, I think what you're because it's a conversation that you and I have quite often where we're you know we match with someone genetically. The first initial conversation is, well, my, my people are from Alabama or Mississippi. And that's it. They're, you know, they're not willing to look further afield. And the, I guess there's a couple of things that you have to bear in mind. Um how far back they can trace their ancestry in Mississippi, because there's going to be two periods. There's mm -hmm. either going to, their ancestor either got there, their earlier ancestors either got there when kind of Virginia, North Carolina, and South, South Carolina started literally shipping our people down, down the river. That's where that phrase comes from, going down river. Part of the hundreds of thousands of, of African-American slaves who were sent down that way, or they came much later. Um, like in the very, very late 1700s, the very early 1800s, they could have come in through, come in directly, but the chances are they still, so many of our ancestors came through, is it Charleston? Which yeah. place in South Carolina did they come through? Was, was it Charleston? It was, it was mainly the port of Charleston. That was it. Matter of fact, in the, um, I don't know if you guys saw it. Thank you, Barbara, first of all. Mississippi was granted statehood in December, 1817. And Karen feels like this was a great tip as far as the colonial records. And Deborah um, made the comment saying that this was helpful information, but she's trying to go from slave owner family to learn more about the enslaved instead of the opposite and instead of the other way around. And for you, Deborah, you still have to do the exact same thing. You have to go, you, you, you do have to do the, um, find out who your white family members are and still look at the land deeds and the land records and the wills and the slave records and things of that nature. Uh, Jennifer, yes, people were in Mississippi. Um, Mississippi was settled. Obviously, Mississippi was settled for a long period of time. The Spanish were there first. In terms of Europeans, I mean, this is not to ignore Native American brothers and sisters who were clearly there before anyone else was. But the first settlers to actually rock up the first European people to arrive in Mississippi were the Spanish. Then the French kind of got in there for a little bit. Then it became um, an English speaking speaking territory. But um and I don't know what the pop I don't know what the kind of population figures were from like eight, you know the late 1700s to statehood in 1817. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. One other thing that I wanted to say before, I, because I've been meaning to say this and keep forgetting it. Um, for those of you who have ancestry subscriptions, you know, we keep talking about uh, enslavers, probate records and wills. If you go to the, the wills and probate bit on ancestry, um, keep your fingers crossed, 
you you know hopefully you can actually find the will of the person that you're looking for and again it's just worth remembering that between the revolutionary war war of 1812 civil war you know some of these records got lost we'll never be able to get them back but i would probably say i've got a 60 to 65 percent success rate in terms of one understanding that the will did exist um and finding it there and the way that Ancestry presents it, it's almost like you have your ancestors' uh, probate file. You know, it's got the little name on the front, the little name on the front of the folder to tell you who it is. You open up the folder. There's the first record. There's the second record. There's the wills. There's the estate. You know, the estate inventories. Uh, they had minor children. If the children were orphaned, they're like other separate paperwork bits for that. So really, just an invaluable source of um of information in terms of our, of our research. Some other things that I wanted to get you guys thinking about. Again, back when I was a newbie, I would say within the first three years of uh, doing genealogy, I'm thankful that I didn't blindly copy out of people's tree ancestry trees. Never do that, by the way. Never, ever Never. do that. Never, Bad ever. call. <laughs> but I assume that people had, or had done their research and that everything in their tree was correct and blah, 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 and come to find out that it wasn't. Critical thinking will get you to assess whether or not the tree that you're looking at is, I, I don't want to say good or bad, but accurate, whether it's, you know, whether it's accurate and truthful. So if, you're, if the only thing that you see on a, for a person's entry for an ancestor is an ancestry tree, run. Just get out of it, back away, just don't use the information. You need to see that they actually have records. And I'm going to say that some records are better than others. Uh, obviously, anything with um, like a, a birth certificate, death certificate, marriage certificate, deed, any of those kind of what I call hard records are brilliant. Things like the Netherlands genealogical files, no. 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 Because those, those, those are basically user-generated um, records, and so many of them that I've seen have errors in them. I, for me, when, I, when it pops up as an ancestry hint, I just ignore. I just hit ignore. Uh, there's the American marriage and American death records. Again, they're exactly the same thing. Those are largely user-generated, can sometimes be filled with errors. And when I see them, I just click ignore and kind of go on. And then there's this index too. I can't remember. Yes. I can't remember the name of it, but there's a, a particular index that continues to pop up, and it's 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 terrible. It it's is. absolutely terrible. So, but yeah, don't don't follow other people's trees. Do your own work, and and it's not to say that you know when you're getting on somebody else's tree, especially as a newcomer, and you're like, oh, I got all the information, and this this that. And then you come back later, and if you're really into doing your research and you find out all of it is wrong, you know how much time that's going to take you to de delete all that stuff and then put in the right stuff when all you had to do was just kind of type in the name yourself and do the work yourself. And um, so don't follow, don't. I don't even follow my tree. I, and I tell families that. I tell my family that. My tree is there for you to view. But well, please don't follow it because it might be something wrong. Right. James just said, be open, but skeptical, you know, yep. about all of that. And that and that's very, very, very true um, because I don't follow my tree. My tree I, is as accurate as I try to make it to be. My tree is always on documents, always on records, always on the DNA stuff. But even that can be wrong sometimes because there may be somebody who took on someone's child and nobody knew about it. Yep. And and it throws you straight into the the the, the depths of hell because that's what happened to me with my Lula Peterson, my great grandmother. I went years thinking that her parents were as what's his name? Enoch Peterson and Ann Shepherd. Years. And then I got a death certificate. Threw me for a loop. It's Charles Peterson and Molly Settles. That now, the thing about it is, is that I found out that Charles and Enoch were brothers. 
But it was so amazing because Enoch had a daughter the same exact year, the same exact month as my great grandmother was born. So I had to change it. When I tell you guys, I panicked. Anybody who's friends with me on Facebook, they saw it. I was like, oh, my God. All the pieces I just added, and they were wrong. It's wrong, but I saved them. I removed them, but I didn't delete them. And it was good that I didn't do that because I ended up adding Enoch back on because Enoch ended up being my great-grandmother's uncle. And I found the information, but, oh, God, these things, it, it, it's just its just amazing to me. But I wanted to... um say something. James Morgan put up, don't forget the New Orleans and mobile and mobile connection. Louisiana is so different because Louisiana was was definitely in a in a whole nother process like the rest of the colonies before any of those in between states like Mississippi, Alabama, and so on and so forth. So he is exactly right about that. And um then we have uh Jennifer Bennett, who says, girl, why does Ancestry even use these <laughs> years of generated records? And I feel you on that. I get it. And then um, Booker Piper says, yes, out of wedlock marriages. That's And she's talking about the things that I was just saying. Those people just come out of nowhere. And you, you're looking at them like, where in the world did you come from? So even my tree, who is... It's small right now because, sadly, my tree was hacked and I had to rebuild it. But I'm glad I had to rebuild it because now it's more accurate than it's ever been. And it's almost 8,000 people on it and all 8,000 are related. Definitely. Now, is it the right children sometimes? I don't know. I'll find out later. But overall, yes, everything is pretty much correct on my tree. Then you got people like Brian who have six figures on his tree. Yeah, I said it. Six figures, y'all. He has one, over 100,000 people on his tree. And they're related. They're documented. It's there. And he's my family member. So one day my tree going to look like his. And that scares me. But that's, you know, that's basically what that is. But my God, the time has flown. No, it's not that time already, is it? <laughs> Four fifty-five. <laughs> I just, I just feel as though we just kind of warmed up to the topic. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, one other kind of research tip that I was going to give you is if I'm really stuck on some ancestors, trying to figure out who their parents were. I mean, I will look at people's trees just to see if they have parents for them and what names they've put. But then I'll go into Google especially Google Books, because I just, that's just genius, that thing. Um, and I'll just type in those names, and I will just keep hammering and chipping and chipping away. Um, sometimes I'm lucky, sometimes, sometimes I'm not. A lot of times, though, I'll find out that some people who put an supposed ancestors in their family trees, they, they've actually kind of made them up. Yeah. You know, I, I have, I've come across that a few times, and I've even seen that in lineage books. Or uh, like uh, updated lineage books going, um, yeah, Jane Evans, she never, you know, from Asheville, North Carolina, born 1698. Yeah, she never existed. Hmm. So, all, again, as Donnie and I have both been kind of preaching over this uh, today, always do your research. You can kind of, sometimes family trees can steer you in a direction, but you still have to research to make sure that that information is correct. Right. Yes, yes, that's what you do. James said, I am clutching my imaginary pearls thinking about my tree being hacked. Trust me, James, when that happened to me, I had to I had to sit down for a minute and like really kind of sit back and just look at what was going on because it was such a mess. It, it, I couldn't believe what had happened that I just I had to delete it. And it hurt me, but it helped because now my tree is probably it's so much better than what it was and and it's it's right where it's supposed to be and now i have additional copies of it in spots so if something like that does happen again then i'll be ready for it and um 
Yeah, and, and, but I, I thought I was going to die. I, it was already bad enough when Lula did what she did to me and ended up being somebody else's child. But then to go and, and have that happen. But we have another question. We'll take this last question from Deborah, And um, then we're going to tell you about in the next two weeks show. Let me tell y'all how excited. I'm so excited about that. So Deborah's question is, how do you remove someone but not delete them? Sometimes I find someone I'm not sure about, but include them until I get to research later. Well, for me, when I when I had to delete Enoch, I just I um I removed Lula from him. And when I removed Lula as his child, that moved him completely off the tree and he was just more or less set aside in the background as opposed to being connected to the tree. So it was really good that when I found out that Enoch and Charles was um Enoch and Charles were brothers. I was able to just bam, connect it right back together, and it didn't happen. Brian, what was you gonna say? Um, I was gonna have a very similar example because um, I spent about three weeks going through my uh, Holloways. Because um, every once in a while, I do go back to the oldest parts of my tree, add more records, double check things, just to make sure that um everything is as it should be and that it's accurate. And I came across this George Holloway that I couldn't make sense of. Um, but I knew he was related to the Holloway family that I was looking for in Virginia, in Virginia. So all I did was detach him from the people that I had as his parents. So I didn't delete him. I just detached him, set him to one side, made a note, because my memory is horrible, made a note about what I'd done. Come to find out when I was uh, re kind of doing my, the Holloway part of my tree, um, I did need him. Um, I finally figured out exactly who he was because Holloway's and the name George, George Holloway, any George Holloway's between, born between 1710 and 1725, there must be 70 of them. Yeah. Slight exaggeration, bit, but it's a bit ridiculous. And in the, even in the lineage books, people were getting confused or were conflating different Georges all born around the same time. So I'm thankful that I didn't because that particular George that I just put to one side, he must have had something like he had four Quaker, had four different wives, something like 23 kids. So there was no way I was going to delete all that because it was just too, too much hard work that had gone into that. So thankful that I was able to find out what part of the Holloway family tree that he did belong to, to quickly put him, to quickly put him in there. Yeah. And again, that's all part of critical thinking as well. Going back to the oldest parts of your tree that you've done to make sure that everything is accurate, that it does line up, um, and that, it, that it's doing what it wants you to do. And DNA will make us do that more often than anything else. Yes. Because yeah. thinking about it, because normally when I match on someone, and especially if I'm matching someone who comes from majority European background, I should not only hit our common ancestors, depending on when they were born in the 1700s, I think should be, we should be able to match on another two or three sets. I should be matching on majority European people on the maternal side, the paternal side, and anything from two to four generations on both the maternal and paternal sides of the family. When that doesn't happen, that sets my alarm bells ringing, and I'm thinking, something ain't right. Happened to me twice with my Holloways. I had to go back into the records, rejig the tree, and then boom, overnight, started getting matches like that, going all the way back to a Holloway who, who lived, was born in like the 1690s. But that's because I was critically assessing the work that I had done, the sources that I'd used, the conclusions that people had reached, and then just returned to it and just started unpicking it. Yes, that's awesome. So... I want to read some of these um, things before we go. Uh, Flower Stewart said, thank you, very helpful. And Jennifer Bennett, she says, when I see that someone has that many people on their tree, I assume they're just hint happy, and I ignore the tree, laugh out loud. It just makes Well, me Jennifer, I'm going to say, because um, I've gotten into this discussion on Facebook about family tree size, always be mindful that people – use their trees in different ways. People want to accomplish different things with their tree. 
So when I started and had a much smaller tree, I was only interested in learning about doing traditional ancestry. Who are my people? Names, where were they living? And their family. 15 years, well, 13 years down the line, my journey has morphed. Danya's journey has morphed. Our research goals are completely different. So mine, like I said, my tree is now knocking on something like 110,000 people. Mine is a national research tree. Yep. Because I'm convinced, and DNA and uh, records are slowly starting to prove this, that if you're an American, even if, you, if you're second-generation American who's married into a family that had been there for ages, all you need is one colonial ancestral line to be related to a whole lot of other Americans. Um, and that's what my tree is about. It's about bringing Americans together who don't look alike, don't pray to the same God, don't pray alike, have you know different educational attainments, just all those different factors. Really, that a lot of my people are going to be, you know, our shared ancestry is going to go back to early colonial America. So again, I don't care if you're Hispanic, Native American, Black, person of color, white, whatever the mix is. That's what I want my tree to prove that right. millions of Americans across this country are related to each other. And we just, you know, we just don't know how. And DNA and going through the records and doing what I'm doing and what Don is doing is slowly proving that. So that's the reason why my tree is so large. The only way that I can prove that is by, you know, getting as much documentation as possible and just, you know, really kind of building that tree out. Right. So then James says, um, you know, he was responding as far as, you know, when the tree, when I was telling him how my tree was hacked and everything. And he said, that's why I have my updated JetCom file offline. And and I've done that too. And he said, lesson learned, good for you. And then um, A.E. Barlow says, very helpful, another wonderful and resourceful show. I'm so, so glad that you are um, following us and everything. And I'll definitely put the book details in. And then we have another from Barbara where she says, once again, kudos to you both for today's information. Um, Deborah Cross says, I've done two DNA tests and no African-American, but with so many slave-owning families in my Southern ancestry, I can't believe with what I've read and the pre-Civil War period that there was no mix in my ancestry. And it's, I mean, it's possible, but you just have to, you know, keep looking, even if it may not be in yours, but it might be in somebody else's. That's what you need to understand. You may not have that African-American mix, but somebody has your European mix in their African-American blood. And that's yeah, where yeah, you become. Yeah. yeah, that's when you and that person become cousins. And then um, Loretta Oregon, she says, very helpful information. My research has hit a wall. So thank you, because this will help me get started again. And and that's what we're here for, Loretta, to help break down those brick walls. And speaking of brick walls and DNA, because we're getting ready to get out of here. Next, the next, in the next episode, you guys are going to be so excited because we are interviewing Dr. Jackson and our geneticist, Jennifer Caldwell. These are the people that's running our Howard DNA project. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so now, if you have questions about the DNA project that we have going on as far as Edgeville is concerned, the show that's going to be aired on June 17th is the one you need to watch. So basically, just to give you a quick up, you know, give you an update on what the DNA project is. Edgeville, South Carolina. That's where our family is from. That's where Brian and our family is from. And we believe that everybody in Edgefield is related. Howard University has graciously stated that they want to help us prove that. Yes, James, hate you. <laughs> so they are, they're going to help us prove if proof, true or false, if Edgefield is all related. Now, Edgefield is... Um, was originally known as the 96 and it had a lot of counties that came 
from the 96. But as we've done our research, we found our families going as far as places like Lee County and covering <laughs> areas of Darlington and um, Kershaw, which are all further away up into Cherokee and so on and so forth. So we started to realize that it might be a little bigger than we thought. And Howard is going to help us fix that. Howard is going to help us look at our families, try to break down some brick walls in our families, try to find some of our connections. This is for Black, White, Native American, Hispanic. This is for anybody who has connections to the 96th district. Anybody. This is not a one, uh, one race or one ethnicity. We can't do that. We can't do our proof without you. We can't do it. And so the best way to get your questions answered is to talk to the four of us because Brian and I are the administrative side along with our cousins Sharon and Loretta, but they're not going to be on the show. But So you got Brian and I, and then you'll have um, Jennifer Caldwell, who is our geneticist, and Dr. Fatima Jackson, who is the head of the uh, biology department at Howard University. And they're gonna be here to answer whatever question you have about anything when it comes to this particular project. They may even throw in some answers for other stuff that you have. You never know. So definitely, definitely tune in um, to that. And- uh, Can I do a shout out? Yes, yes. Okay, still on topic. Um, I've got three shout outs for people. Just to prove that this is a totally inclusive, um, Thankfully, we've been getting um, people submitting their DNA, um, and again, a, a wide group of people. If you are a descendant of Governor James Shepard of South Carolina, we would love to have your DNA, because no one, no one knows who that man's grandparents, so this is the parents of his father. We know his father came from Virginia, but that's it. We need your DNA to push his story back further. If, you're a, if you are a descendant of James Henry Hammond, if you are a descendant of Preston Brooks or Zachariah Brooks, mm. we, need your D, we need your DNA. Yes, so that is, that is a special call out for descendants of those three people. Um, someone, oh, Jennifer said that it would be great if we could actually talk about um, uh, enslavement research outside of the states. Unfortunately, as much as I would love to be able to discuss it, and, and Donna can talk about it from her point of view, I don't have any experience of doing that. Um, I've never accessed enslavement records for any of, for anyone who wasn't born in the United States. So when it comes to the Caribbean, Central America, Latin America, Mexico, I wouldn't be able to talk, I wouldn't be able to discuss it because I just don't have any experience with those records. That's a new thing for me, and I'm actually working on it, but I'm not going to say we won't do the show, because if I'm working on it, Brian knows he's going to be working on it soon. <laughs> <laughs> with that being said, he'll get the experience, and we, and we both will be able to do it. So that 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 is definitely, that can be a show. It just may not happen right away, but it will definitely be a show, because I have seniors who are from Barbados, and, and we're going to have to figure all that out, and that's a whole nother monster, so... Um, but yes, I'm, I'm so glad that you guys joined us today. We had a great, this was a great show. And so make sure you mark your calendars for June 17th, four o'clock. Um, James knows Dr. Jackson and he says that she is the best. And she is, James, when she looked at our tree, she was in awe. She was like, oh my God. And um Booker Piper says, my family is from Edgefield. I have a will about Willis Piper with my three-time great-grandmother on it, still trying to break down brick walls. Um, and she says she will be contacting us. Uh, James, you may want to get in touch with A.E. Barlow because she's doing the HU, you know, as well. So you guys may be bison baby, bison partners together. I'm a tiger. I'm a Jackson State person. But... I support all black colleges. So thank you guys again for, you know, signing in and don't forget, keep it on your calendar. 
ask the questions next week. No, in two weeks, June seventeenth, we're gonna get it going. Uh, someone's asking if Savannah's part of the DNA projects. Savannah, Georgia. I believe so. Uh, I mean, I know the part of what to, 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 to. It depends. I have to look at the. I have to look. <laughs> That's right. Savannah is closer to the Florida line. Um, I would have thought it. It doesn't, but Granville. When because originally when it was just four counties, it split it down the middle, all the way from the top of South Carolina to the bottom of South Carolina. But I'm going right now. I'm going to say no. But she has Pinckney descendants. That's the Edgeville name. Yeah, that's true. It is. Karen, we're going to try to get in touch with you. Let us look up some stuff, and we'll talk to you a little more because. Pinckney is, is is definitely a name out of Edgefield. And James, I'm not thinking about you. I still love you too. Talking about because I went to Jackson State. And he was like, he's sorry, but whatever. <laughs> you, know, swack, you, you can't, once you go swack, you can't go back. But that's <laughs> that's yeah. what that is. So um now Augusta, that's more likely. Because again, the way that that border was changing between South Carolina and Georgia, that's, that's, it's literally just back and forth. Yeah, so if you have family in Augusta, that's definitely a, a, a area we would love for you to, to participate. Matter of fact, I think some Brooks has actually moved to Augusta, Georgia. I so, believe they did, yep. So yes, definitely. Even if you're a white Brooks and you relate to Preston Brooks or you think you might relate to Preston Brooks, please send your DNA in. Right now we have a, a whole slew of, and I'm so glad to say we're knocking on 60's door. And um, we have this whole slew of different African American, Caucasian, Hispanic. We we have them coming in, and Howard is going to do so much. So definitely log in June seventeenth. Listen up, June seventeenth. Follow Genealogy Adventures so you can get the reminder for June seventeenth. It is a must. It is a must. So I'm Donya. I'm Brian. Thank you guys again, and we will talk with you soon. Bye. All the best. Enjoy your Sunday. Bye.